Stay tuned. Okay, I, it's a fairly grand title. Um, it, in some ways, it's a. Uh, it, the, this talk arose out of me reading some scriptures that challenged me, and I had to think about what they meant for me and so on. Uh, and I guess I'll try and take you on that that journey if I can, and, and throw some light on the things along the way. So this is Leviticus. Chapter 22, verse 17, verse 19, I beg your pardon. This is the part of the uh, description or definition of the offerings, the sacrifices that the children of Israel have to make. It says, You shall offer at your own will a male without blemish of the beeves or of the sheep or of the goats, but whatsoever has a blemish, that shall you not offer, for it shall not be acceptable for you. And whosoever offers a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord to accomplish his vow, or a free will offering in beeves or sheep, it shall be perfect to be accepted. There shall be no blemish therein. The Lord wants perfect offerings, perfect sacrifices. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So our sacrifice, our service to the Lord needs to be good and acceptable and perfect according to the will of God, an offering without blemish. Not broken not just when convenient, when we can fit it in because there's nothing on TV. Uh, Pastor Paul touched on some of these things today. Our, our sacrifice includes coming to meetings to contribute because our fellowship and our conversation with our brothers and sisters builds them up. We shouldn't whinge and whine about our difficulties, and pour out our woes but rather try and encourage others, not burden them with complaints. That doesn't mean we can't ask for advice about some situation or need or other, but our primary goal has to be serving others. That's our sacrifice. Selflessness, not selfishness. Caring for others more than caring for ourselves. And I came across all... Or got, these ideas, I was reading Malachi, um, the last book in the Old Testament, and he was prophesying in the days of Nehemiah when they were uh, the last of the exiles to come back from Babylon. And he talks about the corruption and the wickedness the, of the worship in the temple at the time. Um, it's worth reading if you wanted to in Malachi chapter 1. Um, there's sort of questions and answers about how this goes on but the people seemed to be getting comfortable God was not front and centre of their lives God had become an extracurricular activity if you like they were going through the motions without care or thought taking shortcuts there were an awful lot of blemishes in their sacrifices and the prophet says that very clearly. One commentary I read on this said that they had be their interest in God was crowded to the margins of their lives 
and they became preoccupied with themselves. This is a real danger, I think, if we're not careful. We've got to look to the Spirit. We've got to make sure that we're living lives, that our testimony is what God would have it to be. Because one of the things that people notice about us is our testimony, our life, the way we lead our lives, the, the difference between our lives and those in the world. And I'm sure a number of us would have been in workplaces where people have got to the point of apologising when they swear because they've noticed that we don't swear. Little things like that. But that's our, our testimony. And our testimony is our offering, our sacrifice to the Lord. And there are blemishes that can come on that if we're not careful. There's obvious blemishes like not going to meetings, not praying, not reading the word. But there are some subtle blemishes like grumpiness, rudeness, short-tempered, self-centred behaviour. Those are things which people will notice. Those are things which can creep in to our lives. But verse 2 up there tells us that we've, our mind is transformed so that we can prove or test what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's the battle we have every day, putting down our natural mind and carnal nature, because that's always there. We can't get rid of that. We've just got to sit on it, push it down. Let the Spirit guide our lives by putting on the mind of Christ. We need to understand what God's will is so that we can prove or test that perfect will. In 1 John, it says that God is love. And the word used there is translated in other places as charity or selfless giving. So the question is, are we exhibiting the characteristics of charity? Is God's love shining out in our lives? That's defined for us in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunts not itself, is not puffed up. Charity does not behave itself unseemly, seek her own, seeks not her own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil doesn't rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Charity bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. But it's charity that's the, the really important thing. And I'm sure we've all read those scriptures, we've all thought about them maybe but I'd like to use them as a mirror to hold up in front of our lives and go back through those, that piece of scripture from the Amplified Bible just sort of point by point and see whether this describes our character which is what people see in us, our character is the thing that is our testimony. So let's have a look. The first one from the Amplified Bible, I've replaced, well, in the Amplified they use the word love. Love endures long and is patient and kind. And the test I'd like to apply is can we replace the word love with our name and is that then a description that people might use to describe us? It's a sort of a checklist, if you like. So, question I ask myself. David endures long and is patient and kind. And I'm not going to ask for comments on that. Um, <laughs> that would be, uh, yeah, it's not a good thing to do. Um, 
My answer is sometimes. Not always. And as soon as I get to that sort of point, that says there's some work I can do. There's something that I need to think about, pray about, work on. Love never is envious, nor boils over with jealousy. This is tied in with covetousness. One of the uh, Old Testament Ten Commandments is about covetousness, about wanting stuff that we haven't got, wanting stuff that other people have got, wishing we had more of something that someone else has got. We shouldn't be envious or boil over with jealousy. Love never is envious. Oops, read the wrong one. Love is not boastful or vainglorious. It does not display itself haughtily. Do we always want to make sure that people are aware how clever we are? how good we are, all the places we've been, the things we've seen? Or are we more interested in finding out what they're about, where they come from, what's happening in their lives, rather than broadcasting what's happening in our life? We should be more interested in the people we're talking to, in getting information from them, rather than telling them how terrific we are. The next verse, love is not conceited, arrogant, and inflated with pride. We shouldn't have tickets on ourselves. We shouldn't see ourselves as the be-all and end-all. The Lord wants us to be humble. This is all about humility, not boasting, not pushing our, putting ourselves forward. Love is not rude or unmannerly and does not act unbecomingly. Good manners is something which is, uh, as a grumpy old man, is disappearing. But it's what makes society work properly. People don't get offended if people are not rude if they behave themselves thinking and again it gets back to this thinking about other people making other people more important than ourselves love does not think does not insist on its own rights or its own things for it is not self seeking If we find ourselves saying, I am entitled, it's my right, I think we need to pull ourselves up, stand back. There may be some things, yes, uh, we are God's children, but that doesn't entitle us in the world to put ourselves forward in ways. We should again be thinking about our behaviour and how that affects other people. And perhaps one simple test, if you're about to do something, you think, I'm entitled to do this. If you were to then think about what would happen if everybody did that. Very simple example, you might have a piece of paper in your hand. It's a long way to the rubbish bin. Well, I can drop that. It's only one bit of paper. It's not going to make a big difference. But if everybody dropped their one bit of paper... We've soon got a pigsty. No offence to the pigs. We've got to be careful about these things. Our behaviour is noticed. And if we do things that are going to cause trouble, that's not the testimony that the Lord wants. It's a very simple test. What would happen if everybody did this? Back in the COVID days, the the question might have been, what would happen if I take my mask off? It's all right, everyone else is wearing theirs. 
They'll be safe, I'm all right. But if you take yours off, why doesn't everybody else take theirs off? And so on. There's a whole raft of these things that we can apply a very simple test to. We are not necessarily entitled to behave in a way which is antisocial. Love is not touchy or fretful or resentful. Do we get upset at little things? Um, do we fly off the handle? I have been known to. Um, it's something you've got to work on. But it's part of our... When things start going wrong, the calm people are the ones that people notice. Um, I had a, a, an accident at work some years ago, um, broke my wrist, and people came up afterwards and said, well, why weren't you jumping and screaming and yelling? Why weren't you swearing and things? And the reason was I was just praying as hard as I could. But they noticed the difference behaviour. And that is important. We've got to be able to deal with adversity without flying off. Love takes no account of the evil done to it, pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Can you imagine what the world would be like if nations didn't take account of the evil done to it or evil perceived to be done to it? There wouldn't be wars, there wouldn't be trade wars, there wouldn't be a whole raft of things. And that happens in our lives as well. There's no vendettas, no payback, no getting even. You do that to me, I'll get you, don't worry, I'll get you. That's not what the Lord wants. And if we take no account of the evil done to it, there's no offence. If there's no offence, we then don't have to go around forgiving. It's the, the start of a chain, taking offence at things, counting in the evil, storing it up. It doesn't do us any good. We just get all churned up inside, which certainly doesn't do us any good. And it ties in with some of the one of the others that comes up later. Love does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Do we go to watch sporting events to see the accidents? Or do we watch it to see the athletic efforts going on? Are we attracted to movies full of violence and people mistreating one another? We shouldn't be rejoicing at these sorts of things, but we should rejoice when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes along. This is about overcoming. This is about, and there's a lot, there's overlap with these, but not flying off the handle when things go wrong, but calmly dealing with the situation, calmly working through it. And it makes a huge difference. There's a saying, and I wish I could remember it exactly, but it's something along the lines of the, 
The people that matter are those that keep their heads when everyone else around them is losing theirs. It's, it's to do with being able to deal with things when things aren't going the way you want them to. Just calmly dealing with the situation that comes along. Love is ever ready to believe the best of every person. I think this is a big one. It covers a whole lot of things. It's all about giving people benefit of the doubt. With the possible exception of the Nigerian prince that keeps sending me emails, we probably should be trusting people until there's evidence that they're trying to, uh, to harm us. And even then, we've got to be careful. That's not to say we're naive. It's not to say that we are foolish in, in these things. But if, some, if we are offended by someone, the first step should be, are they aware they've offended me or was it an accident? Are they trying to get me riled up or is it just they're not aware of what my situation is? We should always be giving people the benefit of the doubt. Not assuming that they jumped on your toe deliberately, but rather they were looking the other way and just happened to tread on it on the way past. Because if we act that way, the offence doesn't occur. And then we don't have to go through all the other processes. We have to think about giving people the benefit of the doubt. And again, not to be naively accepting everything that comes along, but to think about, is it possible these people aren't trying to scam me, they're just trying to sell something? Conversely, it's quite often that they are trying to scam you and you can just ignore the telephone call or whatever it is. But in our day-to-day -day interactions with people, we should always be trying to give them the benefit of the doubt. Love's hopes are fadeless under all circumstances. This is, it's, it comes in the same verse as bearing up under anything and everything. We always hope things are going to turn out for the best. And if we can do that, a lot of our issues will disappear. We don't get hung up on things and we put all those together love endures everything without weakening so there's the whole lot the checklist You could print it out and stick it on your fridge and go up every morning and say, or every evening and say, how have I done today? David, did you endure long and were patient and kind? David, did you not get envious? David, were you not boastful? And so on. Put our name in there and it becomes real. It becomes something that we need to worry about. That's our sacrifice, putting others before ourselves. And that seems tough. That might seem a bit heavy. But it's, in fact, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you look through that list of things and compare it with this list that, that we've just had and compare it with this list of things, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. It's all part of the same... Uh, same behaviour, same things coming out. And it's all to do with building ourselves up in the Holy Spirit, letting the Holy Spirit guide our behaviour rather than our natural reactions. If our lives are to be an offering to the Lord, these are the things that should be pouring out of us. These are the things that people should be seeing we need to be aware 
of our behaviour, aware of that long of that list about charity, and see that that's what's happening. The Lord didn't request sacrifices from the children of Israel because he liked the smell of roast meat. It was a discipline. It was a tangible demonstration of obedience to the word of God. It was something that they could do almost ritually. They didn't have the Holy Spirit. They needed routines to keep them focused, to keep them doing things. We have the Spirit within guiding, teaching, correcting. We can use the Scriptures to guide, teach and correct in conjunction with the Spirit. We just need to listen and follow and that will get rid of the blemishes from our offering. I was challenged by the verses from Malachi. Uh, Chapter 1, verse 6 to 14, if you want to have a look at it. I hope it did me some good, and we need to be open to this sort of correction. Our offering to God is the lives we lead, nothing less. He's given us a new character. We've been born again, we've started again, we've got a new character through the Holy Spirit. we listen to and follow the guiding of the spirit we will lead the selfless lives of love or charity that pleases the Lord our offering our lives will be acceptable and pleasing to God and by the way it will also be fulfilling full of peace, joy, satisfying we won't have a lot of angst We won't have a lot of stress. Our lives will indeed be blessed. And all the people said...